Well, good evening. Welcome back to church. Go ahead and come on in. Grab your hymnal stand and we'll turn to number 135. Hymn number 135, we'll sing the rest of the folks in Nothing But the Blood, number 135. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part on this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Brother Zach Reynolds, would you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. All right, go ahead and take a seat. Turn to number 61. <clears throat> Hymn number 61, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thus bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thus bought us thine we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you'll hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, 
who will hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to save. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Alright, and turn to number 411. Number 411, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Our adult choir is going to come now and sing a special O sacred lamb.
song and um, that song brother Gerald composed and our choirs learned that and it's a real blessing I'm grateful that not just our kids are willing to sing but our adults sing in our our choir and I appreciate Jameson leading us some of you know that last Saturday was our men's advance and I had asked a couple men to be ready to give testimony and so I'm gonna have brother Pat and then brother Jimmy to just share a word about what God spoke to them about, or I really just told them, give us a five-minute report or testimony. So, Brother Pat, you come first, and then Anthony and Samuel did paper, rock, scissors to see which one of them was going to share. So, uh, Samuel will be last after Brother Jimmy. Go ahead, Pat. Well, I almost didn't go to this men's advance, of course. Last weekend was our 25th anniversary, so... But Angie wasn't feeling so good. She's like, well, you just, you better go. So, <laughs> which I'm glad I did because it, it really spoke to my heart big time this time around. It really, really touched me. So if, if any of y'all didn't go, I'd really put a plug in. It, 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 God can speak to you in a mighty way there. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, one of the things that really spoke to me was that is sowing and reaping. And I, I've always heard it kind of the negative connotation you, you sow bad you reap bad but they they took the other side of the coin where you you sow godly seed you're going to reap godly harvest right. you know and so I, I was like that that really spoke to me because a lot of times we try to reap where we don't sow you know we want God to, to bless us but also we got to put in the work for him to to actually bless something with so uh, it's just like teaching Sunday school if I didn't try to, to study and, and prepare, you know, God, God wouldn't bless our Sunday school as much if I wasn't ready, you know, let him use me like I, I tried to, and so, but it, it was, it was really good, it, 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 it broke my heart several times listening to, listen to them, man, and they want to, to really reach your lives, and, and they really pray really hard and, and prepare really hard for it, and it, it's, it's a really good ministry, I think, and so I'd really, really put it off that to go if you didn't wasn't able to make it this time to go next year thank you as jimmy's coming some of those of you that may not have been they put a about a seven thousand square foot maze together that demonstrated their points they had a powerful garden exhibit about the guy that you know planted good seed and it was pretty powerful but jimmy go ahead and share One of the things that really spoke to me this year at the Men's Advance was the, well, just the name Viplex standing for vision, planning, and execution. And the fact that so many of us get caught up in the planning stage and we never execute. Uh, you know, goes right along with the planting the godly seeds 
And even when we do plan, when we fail to execute, you know, one of the things that they mentioned was current emotions. And we do, we let our emotions get the better of us in so many ways. It's just like Peter, when he was in the garden with Jesus, you know, he was strong, he had a vision, he had made a plan, but he didn't execute that plan. And before the cock crew, he denied Jesus those three times. And how many times do we do that ourselves? Just in everyday life. And that's what really spoke to me and has continued speaking to me since then. Thank you. Well, like they said, yeah, if you weren't able to make it to the men's advance, it's a really powerful thing to go to if you've never been. I would really encourage you to go. But one thing that I kind of got out of it was their planning section, which is vital for a good execution. If you don't plan, your vision will just be a dream, and you can't execute without a plan. And uh, kind of... Like, they kind of went over having, like, your plan, your vision is like a subjective idea, sort of. But then whenever you plan, it'll become your concrete foundation for you to be able to execute that plan. And then you can accomplish whatever has been laid on your heart to do. And one thing was kind of for me, like, getting in the word more and trying to be more being studying more kind of so been trying to use what they've laid out for me to do that and so once again I'd really encourage you if you haven't been even if you're not like you know as old as some of the others even younger guys like me can get a lot of good stuff out of this thing so if you haven't been I'd really encourage you to go so that's all I got All right, now before I preach, I'd like our youth choir to come and sing I Believe God. You youth choir, come on up and uh, sing for me. And uh, Bubba and Eli, why don't y'all come and help them, please? Y'all are still what we call honorary. Honorary members. And some of these kids don't know the song they're getting up to sing, and y'all do know it. And so that helps out a lot. But uh, they'll sing, I believe God, before I get to preach this evening.
It's one of my favorite songs. I believe God. Amen. Let the world say what they will. What I pray for those young people, you pray for those young people. You know they're a target, right? The enemy does not want young people believing God, I can tell you. Amen. But I'm grateful they were willing to sing before I preach. If you got your Bibles, take them out and go to 1 Kings 17. Tonight, we begin a short, well-constructed series on the life of Elijah. Amen. The life of Elijah. 1 Kings 17. Those of you know that we're going through Old Testament stories, Old Testament characters. And we've been doing that now for... Quite a while. Uh, some people mark time by where I was at on what particular individual in the Old Testament. And uh, you're probably going to lose track. I like to keep track with uh, how many... For a while there, I was doing it based on how many children we'd had. You know, we had five kids in six years. So I would say, I started this series two children ago, you know. But uh, whatever the case, it's been a while since we have started going through some Old Testament stories. And some of you, uh, we have some new believers, and they don't know anything about Elijah the prophet. And they don't know anything about some of the old Bible stories. Now, the best way to familiarize yourself is to start your own regular Bible study, daily Bible time. But the fact is, you will not read very far in almost any part of the Bible where you don't come up with at least a reference to Elijah. In the New Testament alone, there's over 30 references by name to the prophet Elias or Elijah. Elijah, his name meant Yahweh is God. He's been referred to as the prophet of fire. He is the preeminent, the most prolific prophet mentioned. By the time Jesus lived, it would be a common cliche when Moses and Elijah were referenced they symbolically were the figureheads of the law and the prophets. They, their names literally were synonymous with the Word of God, the revelation of God. Elijah was uh, a, a prophet that stood as, as a way marker. He was not just the Old Testament voice to the kingdom of Israel, 
but he was a precursor to the coming of Christ, according to the prophecy there in Malachi. And the Bible says that even in Jesus' ministry, that there were those who on their mind was, is this Elijah when they saw John the Baptist? Is this uh, that prophet Elijah? And so Elijah is a very important figure in the Old Testament. So if you would stand with me as we read our text this evening, 1 Kings 17, 1 through 6 will be our text. We've just come off of a number of different kings who have gone. There's been one bloody coup uprising after another in the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. We're we're looking at a time of a divided kingdom. Uh, Solomon, his son Rehoboam, had Judah and really Benjamin and the temple there, Jerusalem, the Levites. But the rest of the tribes had been given to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He led them into idolatry, golden calves that he said represented the God that led them out of Egypt. And they began to worship idols under Jeroboam. But after just a generation, after Jeroboam's son, there was then uh, an a judgment, and the house of Jeroboam was wiped out. But the problem was the kings that were used to judge the previous king were just as wicked as the king that God was replacing, and God is fair. And so judgment falls time after time. And so we had looked at Zimri and then Omri. Omri was the father of Ahab. And the end of chapter 16 introduces Ahab, and it gives his credentials. We talked about Ahab. He had quite a notorious reputation. He was worse than everybody before him. Now, his dad was worse, but he was worse still than his dad. And then, if you remember, we looked at that last verse about Hiel, the Bethelite that built Jericho, and that brings us to chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, That is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Lord, we love you and praise you. And we thank you for your word. And I pray tonight you'd give us wisdom as we look at your man, the prophet Elijah, God. I pray that we would be able to make application to our lives, Lord, as we look at this Old Testament saint and prophet. That we would see New Testament truth, God, in We rejoice in the fact that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you never change. And God, I'm grateful for the fact that you use imperfect vessels, and God, that we can take note of how you've worked. And God, I pray that my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here tonight would be edified and encouraged. We already thank you for the music that stirred us, and Lord, for the ability we have to lift up our voices. And now we ask that you would open your word to our hearts. And Lord, that you would do a work and equip us for the work of the ministry you've given us is our prayer. Lord, if there's someone here that needs to be saved, someone here that is not a a child of God, they, they have not trusted you as Lord and Savior, I pray that tonight your Holy Spirit would open their eyes, open their heart. They would trust you as Lord and Savior and begin that life following you tonight would be our prayer. And above all, we ask you be exalted, lifted up, and glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Elijah considered in the Word of God as a great man. And when I read passages, study passages like this, I like to personalize, ask myself some questions. Are there elements in Elijah's life that would benefit us if we followed them? And clearly, I believe if a man was as close to God as Elijah was, I mean, literally, Elijah was so close to God that God decided he didn't need to die. He took him in a chariot of fire. And Elijah, the word of the Lord came to him, and yet in Jesus' ministry, when the word was made flesh, the Bible says that Elijah came to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses. 
and hang on to your horses, but according to Revelation, Elijah will be back. You know, Elijah's going to get killed, the Bible says. Did you know that? Revelation, the Bible says Elijah and Moses, and, and I know there's people who say, well, you don't believe literally there'll be two prophets, Elijah and Moses, that get killed and slain and lay in the streets and the beast and the false, they rejoice. So I, I kind of tend to think that's probably going to happen the way it says it's going to happen. Elijah, then, I believe, is worthy of our study. And we should ask ourselves, if Elijah was great, he was a man of God that was honored by God, are there things in his life that I could incorporate, that I could take benefit from? As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians to New Testament Christians, is there an example here, an admonition that I can take from the Old Testament? I believe clearly the case would be, uh, sure that we can. And so as we look at Elijah, and I've already mentioned a few things about him, but he's a great study. Some commentators go so far as to, uh, as to almost, uh, they almost turn Elijah into a mythological character and they almost imply that he could have been of supernatural divine origin, that maybe he was more angelic than man, but that's absolutely unbiblical because the Bible clearly tells us, and by the way, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. Do you know that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are? Subject to like passions? Because the Bible says he was. But we don't get his lineage. We don't get his parentage. We don't know who his dad was. It says Elijah the Tishbite. There was a community called Tishbe east of the Jordan, not far from the brook Cherith. And apparently that's where he was from, from Gilead. That's on the other side of Jordan, the east side of Jordan, from both Jerusalem and Samaria in the northern kingdom. So Elijah crossed the Jordan to deliver a message, the Bible says. And it says here that he comes and he stands before Ahab, the most wicked of kings, is confronted by the most powerful of prophets. He comes to him and he addresses uh, Ahab and Ahab and and Elijah they develop we begin to see this relationship of hero protagonist the man of God Elijah and then Ahab the antagonist the the enemy of all things God and one of the worst things that Ahab did was he married Jezebel by the time Elijah stands before him Jezebel had already murdered all of the prophets of God that she could get her hands on we find that out when we see in the following chapters that Obadiah, a servant of Ahab, encounters Elijah. So Elijah, and basically a no-name prophet, shows up from a small town and he pronounces judgment on the most powerful man in the country, the king of Israel. He stood before him and he says, There shall not be dew nor rain these years. Elijah is primarily not addressing the idolatry that Jeroboam got the children of Israel to because when Jezebel and Ahab showed up, they upped the game. They went away from just the calf worship at Dan and Bethel, the golden calf worship, and they began to worship the god of the Zidonians, the gods of Tyre, and Jezebel, her daddy, the Bible says, was Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and they served Baal, and as you study the particular deity, idolatrous deity that they worshipped, the god of Jezebel was Bel Melkareth. He was, or Melkarth. He was uh, a god that was worshipped in Tyre. He was uh, a god of the Zidonians, but he was the god of storms, rains, good crops, and fertility. I simply point that out because this uh, encounter with Elijah and Ahab that we read about. There's a little bit of a subtext that you may not be aware of, but when he says, there will be no rain, he's saying that the God Jezebel has led you to follow is impotent against the God that I serve. And there won't be any rain. Almost as Moses pronounced judgment, not just on Egypt, but on the gods of Egypt, so now Elijah pronounces judgment on Israel and the God, the false God, Baal, that they worshipped. He stood there before a man who had literally the blood of the prophets on he and his wife's hands and he pronounced the word of the Lord. 
and then he got out of there. It doesn't explain. You know, there's things I'd like to know. Like, I'd like to know how he got past security. And by the way, Elijah's a rough-looking dude. Uh, John the Baptist was rough. And do you know the Bible says that you could just see Elijah and say, man, this is a rough-looking guy, you know. Uh, he's dressed in some leather. He was not vegan-friendly in his apparel. Just pointing that out. But later on, when somebody asked what manner of man was it, they described me. He goes, oh, that's got to be Elijah. This guy shows up. And by the way, I don't believe he was trying to, you know, set a new fashion statement. He was just a country boy from a small... Matter of fact, Tishbe was so small, they don't really know exactly where it was. They know the general area, but it's kind of like Stidham or Rayford or Lena or Hannah. It wouldn't take very many generations and it's possible that you might not be able to find it. He was just from a small town. And yet he stands before the king and says, here's some judgment coming your way. Man. And then you see God begin to divinely direct and protect this prophet, Elijah. He provides for him. And so as we look at this great man, I want to just point out a few of the elements of his greatness, a few points that we should be able to make application in our lives as we go. The Bible doesn't give us a lot, but do you know as it introduces him, it does let us know what his mindset was, what his mentality was. And it lets us know what his motivation was. And then we'll look, we'll find out exactly what his method of direction and living was. So it be we begin with this first point that he had a mindset, a, a mentality that some of us maybe need to work on. He says to Ahab, look at the very first thing that Elijah the Tishbite is recorded in the Word of God as saying. It says, He said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. What do you say when you find yourself before a powerful king who has the ability, and by the way, the desire to wipe you out, to kill you. He says, as the Lord God liveth. The Lord God, listen, he had a, a, a mindset that he, listen, he was practicing the presence of God. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. Here we see that Elijah was thinking of God as the sovereign, not Ahab. He was not intimidated by Ahab because he didn't see himself as standing strictly before Ahab. He saw himself as standing before God. You may say, now wait a minute. He was in the capital of a wicked kingdom. He was standing before a wicked king. I don't think God was anywhere around that joint. No, Ahab, Elijah knew better. He knew that he was in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Do you know you can't get away from the presence of God? I mean, that, listen, that's a truth whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Psalms 139, verse 7 and 8, the psalmist says, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? And he points out the omnipresence of God, that God literally is everywhere all at the same time, and we should understand that. That should not be, uh, for a child of God, that should be a comfort, not a drag. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm 16, 11, In thy presence is fullness of joy. But as we compare Scripture, we begin to realize that just the fact that God is omnipresent, He's everywhere, doesn't mean that people walk in His presence. Spiritually speaking, people sometimes are, quote unquote, far from God. But Elijah understood something that we covered last Sunday morning in the message in Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith, that the Hebrews 11:6 6 says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. God is. He's here. We stand in the presence of God. Joshua understood this in Joshua 3.10. He charged and encouraged the people. The living God is among you. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, 
David's complaint as he asked and he heard the mocking of Goliath. He said, this Philistine has defied the armies of the living God. Could I just give you a reminder? We have a living God. Amen? Amen? We have a living God. Listen, what we are about as believers is not adhering to a dead religion, but following a living Lord. Our God lives. I love Luke 24, verse 5. I believe my wife has repeatedly told me it's her favorite verse concerning the resurrection of Christ. Because the angels asked, why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. Amen? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Do you know that when you do a comparative world religion study, you, uh, right off the get-go you make one big mistake. Because can I tell you something? True Christianity can't be categorized in the same category as every other world religion. Because Christianity has a living God. True Christianity. Now I know there's, listen, there's certain quote-unquote churches that absolutely do not experience the blessed presence of the Lord God. But the fact is, as believers, we should. When I was a very young man, excuse me, when I was a young man, my grandmother, Nana Rose, she began to develop her walk with the Lord and she would pass on books. She passed on a book, Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray was from Scotland and we have Scott on both sides of our family. She had done a genealogy and there was a Sarah Elizabeth Murray that had come across, according to Nana Rose, I don't know how she got this or verified it, but came through Ellis Island and immigrated to the United States but was a Scot. And when she found devotional books by a preacher named Murray, she was sure that we were kinfolk somehow or another. But she gave me some Andrew Murray books, but in the middle of those she gave me another little book and it was called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Now, I'm not encouraging any type of old Catholic mysticism or anything like that, but I read that book when I was a young man. It's about a very humble man who developed early a desire for God and His presence. And in that book, he describes as he began to fully intentionally practice the presence of God, he found that even picking up straw off the ground or washing dishes could be an act of worship as he lived before the God that he served. Do you know that Elijah did not see himself as standing alone before the king? He saw him and the king and everybody else standing before God. He saw, he saw him who was invisible. He saw the living God, and he said, God before whom I stand. That was his mindset, and that should also give us a hint as to his motivation. When you understand the presence of God, then it ought to follow that we should understand as believers the fear of God, what it means to have a respect and a fear of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. My kind of rough definition, working definition of fear of God is that you are constantly aware that God is there. Because if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and by the way, the opposite of wisdom is not ignorance. The opposite of wisdom scripturally is foolishness. And the Proverbs pit them one against the other, the wise and the fool. Wisdom and foolishness. And the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. What, a, what is a foolish act? It's an act where you're behaving as if there is no God. And wisdom is the opposite. So if the fool says in his heart there is no God, a wise person walks around constantly understanding he is. That's the fear of the Lord. You understand God is watching. And listen, the reason why Elijah went and said this, can I just say this? He was not motivated by his own desires. He was not motivated by his own ego. It's clear later on the Bible says that he did this by the word of the Lord. As a matter of fact, what we read, we find out that it wasn't Elijah's word. He was simply speaking the word of the Lord. His motivation was the fear of God. 
Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Can I just say this, that in Christianity today, we have lost this aspect of sanctification. Many of us are saved, but there's times when we segment our lives and we divide our lives up and we seem to be able to have this fragmented type of Christianity where, yeah, God's present when we're in here. Or maybe when the sun's coming up and we're breathing deeply out in the yard and we're listening to the Bible on cassette getting ready to run three miles. I love doing that. But you know, God's also present when the peer pressure at work is pushing you back into the same filthy talk that you talked before you were saved. God's still present then too. God's still present. Listen, when an opportunity arises for you to share Christ and you have a choice to make whether you speak the Word of God or you are ashamed of the Gospel, God is present then too. It's easy for us to assume God's present here or there, but Elijah lived as though God was always there because truly, scripturally, He is. And so the fear of the Lord motivated him. And can I say, that? Can I say this? That is why he's not scared of Ahab. He's not perfect. We're going to see there's a point in time when he does run. And he does misjudge the situation that he's in. He's not a perfect man. But can I just say this? He stood without fear of Ahab because of his deep fear and respect for God. Psalms 23, the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The shepherd's psalm. Psalms 23, most of us can quote that, but do we ever personalize that? I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Listen, a true fear of God frees us from the fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You want to be safe? Then don't be a man pleaser. Don't walk around with the fear of man. He was free from peer pressure. Do you know there were other men... Obadiah had saved some of the prophets of God and later on God was going to point out, hey, in Israel there's still 7,000 that haven't bent the knee. But can I just say this? You're going to clearly see that in Elijah's perspective, he was the only one left. Now, we know that's not the case. God corrects that. But Elijah's perspective is, it's just me and God. And that was enough for him to go confront the king. Do you know there will be a time when you'll have to stand alone, young people? There's going to be a time when you're going to have to stand alone. And the Bible says that he was motivated by a fear of the Lord. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Fear not them, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God is the one we should fear, not man. In 1 Kings 18, 13, it says that Jezebel slew the prophets of God. He was standing in a dangerous place, but yet he was standing. The Bible says, the, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. I just like that phrase. Do you know as a Christian you're called to do the same thing? You may say, I'm called to stand up and pronounce drought against the king. No, you're called to stand though. In the presence of God, you're called to stand with courage. All through the scripture, we see examples of God's men standing in courage. Ephesians chapter 6, after being commanded to put on the whole armor of God, we're commanded to put on the armor of God and having done all to stand, stand therefore. It's time that the Christian church, the body of Christ, stand. We need to stop laying down and stop running and we need to stand on the Word of God. We need to speak God's Word. All through the Old Testament, from Moses, Joshua, Caleb, go through Jonathan, Saul's son, David, Nehemiah. These are all men that stood in courage. There are men and women in the Scripture who stood on God's Word and they stood in the face of danger because they had a fear of the Lord. Ezekiel 22, 30, one of the saddest verses in my mind in the Bible. God said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand. 
in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Do you know that God wants us to stand? Elijah stood. He spoke God's word. He had a fear of God. And you may say, but Clay, you're if, so you're saying that I should not fear man and that I should be motivated and be free from peer pressure and, and the fear of man because I have a respectful fear that God's always watching. Isn't that kind of like being worried that somebody's always looking over my shoulder? Well, can I just say this? Somebody always is looking over your shoulder. Years ago, <clears throat> before we really started frequenting Gary's store, years and years ago, the popular hangout and stopping place was Brandon's. Now, that's the quilt shop now. But originally, it was Durrett's, and we were friends with the Durrett's, and then the Durrett's sold it to J.R. Brandon, and we would stop in there at J.R. Brandon's. And I remember I came in there, I came in there all the time because he'd give me free stuff off the rack. Like if a burrito had been rolling up there, I mean the big ones, had been rolling up there for say four or five hours, he'd just give it to me free. I mean they were, they were hard, but the inside was just as good, right? Little cooking does them good, a lot of cooking does them better. I just eat them suckers every day, you know. And, uh, but I was in there one day and JR, dad remember this, he was installing cam security cameras. Because JR had begun to just hemorrhage inventory. Every time he would do inventory and do his books, he was just hemorrhaging money through loss of product shoplifting. But he had two cameras positioned behind the counter. And he told me, he said, Clay, I know that the majority of my shoplifting, I think Dad remembered, he told me, he says, are my employees. Can I tell you something? I would have I just, I, I, I may have even said, it's been a long time, so I don't remember exactly our conversation, but it made me want to say, fire the suckers. But he couldn't fire everybody. It's hard to get good help. But he installed the cameras, and you know what? In the months that followed, I would ask him, and he would say, yeah, completely stopped. All them walking cigarette boxes that would just leave during certain shifts, they just quit, quit leaving. And listen, he didn't fire the staff. The staff just got really better. They had a change of heart. They became better employees. Now, we laugh, but can I tell you something? They did become better employees. They did stop costing him money. They did start, and they were always pretty reliable and showing up there. But whatever they had justified before as a fringe benefit and taking advantage of their boss, whatever they'd been doing before, all of a sudden it stopped, and they became better employees when they knew he was watching. Amen. And you may think this is terrible, but do you know that a part of sanctification, your sanctification, do you know you could give the Holy Spirit a lot bigger lever in your life if you would remind yourself from time to time that God is still watching. You will give an account. I'm going to give an account. And like Brother Pat said, I'm going to reap what I sow. I better sow good seed, but by the way, whether you see it or not, if I sow bad seed, just give it a little while, it's going to come up. Listen, God's not going to be mocked. Elijah had a present, he understood the presence of God. He was motivated by the fear of God. And the last point, we understand his mindset, his motivation, but I love his method, or really his mode of operating. Do you know what the Bible says characterized his life? It starts us off right on the right foot. When we ask ourselves, how did Elijah have the career, had the honor that God gave him? What was significant about him that we could point at? Well, look at what it says in verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, and by the way, if you read the next few chapters, this is repeated in his life over and over again. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Man, what a blessing. But you know why that's true? Because when the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Look at verse 5, first line. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. 
He did according to the word of the Lord. Verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Isn't this odd? Do you know there are certain things you don't have to pray about? Certain things you don't have to pray about. Do you know if you already know what the word of the Lord has said, you don't have to pray about it, you just need to do it. This is an amazing key element in his life. And the word of the Lord said, and he did according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said, so Elijah did what the word of the Lord... And you may say, yeah, but you know what? For Elijah, it probably was a lot easier than for us today with the Bible. I beg to differ. Do you know the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy? And by the way, you may say, well, some things in the Bible don't really make sense to me. Well, I don't think this would have made sense to Elijah. Go and hide by a brook. You can drink of the brook. Okay, I understand that. That makes sense. And the ravens will feed you. Listen. And by the way, ravens was not like an Old Testament code name acronym for Uber Eats. It was not. He's talking about these large black birds, scavenger birds. They will feed you. Right? It wasn't a chain restaurant called Ravens. Right? Just in case, because I know some of your wheels are turning like, what did they cook? Matter of fact, this may be totally wrong, but you know what I kind of think? I kind of think that Ahab's royal chef started having a rash of issues every morning with his food being taken out of the window seals. Maybe that's wrong, but in my mind I'm like, I bet he got the best kind of food delivered, right? But the Bible says, get up and go and I'll feed you. I'll feed you with ravens. Elijah, th this is beautiful. He doesn't say, could you draw me a picture of that God? I've never seen that happen before. I've seen ravens eat stuff that I wouldn't put in my mouth. Ravens were an unclean bird. Like, God, I heard what you said, but this is borderline compromise. I mean, you better make sure they got a nice clean plastic bag they're carrying this food in because ravens are gross can I tell you something when God said this is what you do the Bible says then Elijah went and did what God said to do and can I just say this he went right where God told him to go I know this may be a play on words and this may be semantics I do understand that God searches for us, that God comes for us. But we are commanded to seek God too. Could I just say this? God does not always meet us where we are. That's not actually scriptural. Well, He'll meet us wherever we're at. No, sometimes He will meet us only where He tells us to be. Did you know that? That's not just Old Testament. Listen, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, He told them after the resurrection, you stay in Jerusalem. You wait. On the day of Pentecost, you may say, well, what if some didn't? Do you know what? I'm sure there was probably some of the 400 plus people that might not have. But if they didn't, they didn't get what the apostles got. That's right. That's right. Do you know that the ascension of Christ... The final commission and the ascension of Christ, Matthew 28, 16, says they went to a mountain where Jesus appointed them. Do you know that Jesus did not ascend from every single hill in Jerusalem? Did you know that? He didn't say, everybody around 12, there's going to be a conference call. Just pull your phones out. No, you know what he said? There's one particular hilltop, and this is where I'm appointing come there. And the eleven were told where to be and they all were there. Can I tell you something? If they hadn't been there, they would have missed Jesus. When Thomas wasn't meeting with them, Thomas spent eight days in doubt and fear and discouragement simply because he was not where Jesus showed up. I, like I said, I know, I understand. Do you know that in God's grace coming to sinners that God comes to us. Please understand, I'm not trying to muddy the water. And you may say, 
Well, my favorite song, Big Enough, says he'll meet us right here where, where we are. Well, listen, you cry out to God and he will, listen, he'll bridge the gap. But can I just say this? As followers of Christ, don't expect for the Lord to give you more word if you're not obeying the word he's already given you. Do you understand that? He got word from God when the brook dried up where to go next. And he had to go where God told him to go next. Listen, and it was quite a hike. He went from the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee to all the way west to the Mediterranean Sea and all the way north up into Tyre and Sidon to Zarephath. He had to cover a lot of ground to obey God. But he obeyed God. And you know what? Everywhere he went, God provided for him. Do you know there's professing Christians who never experience God's power, his provision. They really are unclear about his direction. They don't even know if they hear his voice anymore. But the reason why is because way back there, they didn't go to the brook when he told them to go to the brook. Or maybe when he said, hey, go to Zarephath, they said, no, I don't think so. And so they don't have God's provision. And they don't hear God's voice. And they need to stop. Listen, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsaketh. Sometimes you're going to get in hardship. In the next few messages, by the way, we're going to see this. Do you know you can be right smack dab in the middle of God's will and get into hardship? But can I tell you this? You can also be in a lot of hardship when you're out of God's will. You may say, how do you know the difference? The Word of God. That's how you know the difference. The Word of God. And what's scary is when Christians, instead of seeing the direction of God as a blessed path to follow, and I mean that, can I tell you something? I want to follow God's directions. I believe He loves me. I do. I really believe God loves me. Do you know there's things that God put in His Word that I... I, I, I know I'm not bound. I know it's not going to turn, determine my eternity. But there's things that God's been burdening me about. And I appreciate Dad. Dad has a, a kind of a habit on Saturdays. He gives pretty much that day entirely to the Lord. He doesn't, we generally don't schedule. I mean, if an ox is in the ditch or something like that, then yeah. But generally, if you've been around my dad for the last 30-something years, he spends time in the Word at the church, spends time at the house later. And can I just say this? For a, child, for a Christian, a preacher, Sunday's really not a Sabbath. It's not Sabbath, by the way. But there is a principle. And by the way, I believe when you address New Testament believers, I don't think I'm, I'm bound. Jesus is my rest. But can I tell you something? If God works six days and rested, maybe I miss something when I don't just say, hey, this is probably a blessing that I'm missing out on. And you may have to change some plans to follow God's direction. But can I just say this? I believe that obedience to God should never be viewed as a burden. Because if I love the Lord and the Lord loves me, then listen, when he says, kids, young people, when he says honor your mom and dad, he's trying to keep you out of a mess. Can I just say generally speaking, and I know the crowd I'm talking to, there's not one perfect parent in any of the kids' homes that I know and God knew that before he wrote his book down but even you young adults do you know that when you decide to proceed down a path that you know full well is not honoring to your parents don't ex- don't don't act like you're praying for direction I'm sure praying for direction in the area of relationships how do you know listen just recently I had I asked somebody if God wanted to stop this relationship what would he have to do well they couldn't say Give me scriptural reasons, because there were scriptural reasons. They couldn't say, have a spiritual authority, a pastor. T-. That was, listen, basically they said, they would know it in their heart. Well, you know what my Bible says? The heart's deceitful. The heart's deceitful. How do you know God's will? You study His Word. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Study the Word of God to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Don't tell me, hey, I want God's direction when God has already said, go to the brook Cherith. When He said that to Elijah, Elijah said, on my way. Yeah, and you know what? When He gets there, that brook's probably going to dry up. It will. But I'd rather be sitting by a dry brook that God told me to sit by 
You want to be in God's will. Listen, the next instruction may not come anywhere else. Listen, the word of the Lord came to him by the brook. Can I tell you something? Jesus is not going to just show up anywhere. He made life-changing moves. He made unpopular decisions based on the word of God. And yet the Bible says, Elias, in James 5, 16 through 18, he was a man of subject to like passions as we are, and yet he prayed earnestly. He prayed, prayed fervently. Do you know he is an example in James that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And may I just point this out in case you're confused. Elijah was not righteous because he never sinned. He was righteous because he had Put his trust. Do you know that Elijah, just like Abraham, was justified by faith? His obedience was simply evidence that he believed that God was and was a rewarder of those. That God is and is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. I love Deuteronomy 5.29. God says, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Some people wring their hands and they say, look at the mess I'm in. Where's God? And God is saying, oh, if you'd have just listened, I inspired my word and I gave you 20 years of warning to keep you out of the situation you're in right now. That happens. Listen, Elijah, he was motivated by the fear of God and his mindset was that God was who he was standing in front of. But this was his method of living if God said it. He did it. If God said it, He did it. Do you know that every decision you make can and will be justified in your mind? The Bible says every man's way is right in his own eyes. But my question to you is, if God asked you to do something contrary to the way you want to go, would you listen to His Word? Or would you say... No, I think I can be cool on an alternate path. Can I just say this? In my experience, God is always faithful. He's always faithful. If He has put a roadblock up, if He has given direction, it's because He loves you. It says that Elijah did according to the word of the Lord. Could I just ask for a little soul search in here? Is there an area in, in your life that you just simply can't submit to God's word? You just say, you know what, I know what God says, but this is an area. Can I just be real honest? I talked to a man not too long ago, and he said, Clay, he said, I know this is a problem, but I will not forgive so-and-so. And, and this wasn't here in church. This is actually at one of the prisons we were at. He said, he said I, know, I know what you talked about tonight. He said, but I don't think I can make it through what I'm going through. Maybe down the road I can forgive. But right now, the strength that gets me up every day is I can't, I, I hate that man. I can't forgive him. You know, I told him, I said, well, you better. You better. Because the Bible says you'd be better off obeying God and forgiving even when you don't understand. Listen, do you know that forgiving, if God's asked you to forgive, doesn't release the other person, it releases you. Listen, reconciliation is a two-way street. There's people, if there's no repentance, there can't be reconciliation, and I mean that. I want reconciliation. God's a God of reconciliation, but reconciliation requires two parties. But you being free from bitterness, that's between you and God. Amen? Amen? You, you don't have to, listen, you don't have to carry a burden just because it seems to make sense. Do what God says. Some of you are in a relationship that you ought not be in. Some of you have gotten so used to living life on the down low. Do you know what walking in the light, John says in 1 John, that if we know the Lord, if we are saved, if we're children of the light, we should walk in the light. Do you know walking in the light basically just means... You don't live life, I think they refer to living it on the down low. Like where everything you do has to be a secret from the authorities that actually care about you, that's foolishness. 
And I praise God it's not this way anymore. But you know, it used to really bother me. If, I, if, if, if a preacher or a parent walks up and the very lively conversation just boom, dies. Hey, what y'all talking about? Nothing. And then you look at each other. You know, wait till the old geezer gets out of here and then we can start talking again. Yeah, that's cool. No, that's called living in the dark. That's right. Now listen, I don't think everybody has to hear about everything. If somebody's not a part of a problem or you shouldn't gossip. But can I tell you something? Usually when those teenage circles are doing that, it's not because they're so spiritual that they don't want to share with some carnal older person. Usually it's the other way around. Walk in the light. Listen, there's things that God has put in His Word. Do you know that I do not... I did not and I do not believe that honoring my parents and godly pastors and men of, of, listen, men that I look up to, me honoring them is not because I just wholeheartedly trust them. It's because I trust Him. Do you know the Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord? Do you know I had a great mission trip planned, VBS, with Sarah and Jim one year? This is when Don and Bob and Charlie were still deacons. Sarah and Jim had been married a short time, and we were three weeks away from the mission trip. And Brother Jim called me. We was out at the Smith place when he called me. I remember right where I was at because I had everything in order. This was going to be the first trip where everybody's papers were all in order. And Jim called and said, Clay, we're really excited about y'all coming, and I'm not calling to tell you not to come. But I want you to talk to your dad and the men and tell them that the violence has escalated a little bit. And I just think y'all should know before you bring a group that things have gotten a little bit more violent here. And could you just tell them that? And I said, well, Jim, if they ask me, like, specifically, is it just like a gang war, cartels fighting? And he goes, well, yeah, that's all it is, really, a territory kind of territorial fight, he said, but you know the road here that I live on out in front of my house, just between here and basically he's talking about like two blocks down the road, he goes, "Uh, yesterday morning there was three heads laying on the road. That did happen. He goes, now I didn't know them, but somebody did. (laughs) If y'all know Jim, he goes, he goes, I guess the people that they were trying to get a message to, that's probably what he said, but I That's the same road I live on and y'all's vans would be driving on. So could you just tell the guys, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to say, Jim, y'all live there. Have faith in God. We're coming down, brother. Because can I just be real honest? I love going to Mexico. I remember walking into the office with dad and the men. I think I even told my father-in-law about it at the time. Brought some of the men in. Guess what we did that year? Not a mission trip. You may say, well, they just weren't spiritual. No, do you know the Bible says God directs through good counsel, through authority? Do you know, I don't believe it's a drag to obey God. And so, could I just challenge you? Be like Elijah. If the Word of God says it, do it. If the Word of God says stop, stop. If the Word of God says wait, wait. If the Word of God says go, go. Amen? And so I want to challenge you with that. I believe you can be a great man or woman of God. You may be here this evening and you may be lost. Can I just say this? If you don't know Christ, you can't follow God. Trying to abide by some rules will not make you a Christian. Dad covered that this morning. Listen, doing good stuff doesn't make you a Christian. But once you're a Christian, something inside ought to motivate you doing some good works. But if you've got the cart before the horse, if you think that just showing up at church or doing good things is going to get you there, you're mistaken. You're a sinner and you need a Savior. Have you ever repented of your sin, turned to Christ, confessed Him as Lord, and been saved? I'm going to ask Miss Megan to come to the piano. Have you been saved? Do you walk in the presence of God? Do you know where God's going to be? Wherever you're at tomorrow. And do you know what? It is our detriment. We miss out when we refuse to practice the presence of God. We miss out when we don't walk in the fear of the Lord. It is, listen, it's, it's not, 
please don't take this the wrong way, but it, it's not any skin off God's nose, if I can put it in those terms. God doesn't need me. I need Him. I need the Lord. And can I just say this? If, if you're saved, but you've just gotten far from God, can I just point this out? He isn't moving. Come home. You may say, Brother Clay, I've just gone to a far country like the prodigal son. Then listen, yeah, he may not come to the hog pen, but he's looking down the road. If you'll come to yourself and turn around, amen? That's what repentance is. Listen, he'll meet you. He'll run to meet you if you'll turn to him. And so I'd like you to stand with me. At, in, at Lindsay Chapel, we have a time of invitation. That's not to twist your arm or get you to do something that's not real. But it's to give you an opportunity to move if God has spoken to you. Are you an Elijah? Do you practice the presence of God? Are you willing to stand on God's Word and speak God's Word? What motivates you? Are you motivated by the fear of man or by the fear of God? And then lastly, are you saved? Are you a child of God? Do you know that if you need to be saved, the invitation never ends here. You can come. The pastor will direct you to somebody. Come to me. Come to Dad. We'll direct you to somebody who can share with you how to put your faith and trust in Christ. You need to be saved. God loves you. You're not an animal. You're not an accident. You are created by God and morally responsible to that God. And the only way a man will be right before God is to trust the atoning work of Christ on the cross. Have you been saved? Are you a believer? And if you're saved, are you walking in obedience? Are you doing what God asked you to do? I love this song. Let's sing one verse of it. Sing with me. I have decided.